Welcome inside the Paris C Palace, high above 2919 East Broadway. This is a special edition of the Jake Feinberg Show. Coming to you live on Power Talk. Please go to our website, powertalk.live. Download our free app and stream all of our live local programming, including Solomon on Blast, the Jim Parisi Show, and yours truly, the Jake Feinberg Show. And we can't thank you enough for making us part of your day today. And it's so nice to talk to a love child, uh, somebody who comes from a different generation than mine. Uh, she was steeped in the language of the drum and the rhythms of her ancestors. And I basically dedicated my show to the lineage of music, the leadership of those who have taught the music and played it on the bandstand. Obviously, the love inside all of us and the divine. Didi Bridgewater, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Wow, Jake. Thank you for such a beautiful introduction. You're quite welcome, friend. It's nice, Thank you. It's nice to connect with you. Well, I appreciate it. And you opened with the great one, the only, only recorded evidence of my work with the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra. So a, thank you for that as well. A great one. Uh, so a great a one. Great one. So, uh, you know, I, 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 and it swings, but uh, I wanted to read you a quote. Uh, you, you, know ben, you know Ben Vereen? You've hung out with him before? <laughs> yeah, we're friends. We're dear friends. Okay, good. So mm -hmm. I want to read you a quote. I was just transcribing my interview with him from last year. He said, uh, and I just want to get your reaction to it. He goes, everything is an inside job. We are a part of that thinking. And so from within us, it manifests all things. We forget that and we get bogged up with behavioral stuff and environmental things. We fill our consciousness, our mind with unnecessary thoughts. He was using a, a more colorful word than that. Mm -hmm. that. That can block the divine within us, which is the inside voice. When we allow that voice to express itself through us, everything is in divine order in our lives. Musicians, when they get into the zone, they're not thinking about note, they're thinking about feeling. But I just want you to talk about your inner voice, you know, how you found it and that divine order and how you don't allow abstractions to distract you, especially on the bandstand. Well, um, th th my inner voice uh, ha was, was always, always speaking to me. And uh, by the age of seven, I, I realized that I, I needed to do something with that inner voice, and and that is sing. I always have wanted to sing. I always um, saw myself, even without knowing, as as a singer. I announced to my parents when I was seven that when I grew up, I was going to be a very well known and very well respected <laughs> international wow. jazz singer. I never said I was going to be a big star very interesting I, I didn't mention you know anything about celebrity any of that I, I wanted to be well known and well respected and um, musicians were always very very important to me so I have always tried to listen to that inner voice which is our God voice or mm -hmm. you know whatever I did, yeah. divinity you know one one chooses to to deal with it is that 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 you that kind of universal life force that we all have within us. And so I always listened to it. And even when I didn't, circumstances would happen so that I ended up going in the direction that I was supposed to be going in. Um, I always say to people, you know, when you listen to that inner voice or the God voice, however one chooses to interpret that inner voice that, that we all have, whenever you listen to it, it's very interesting because things always seem to happen easily. There is a flow to the way things kind of, you know, seem to, to, to just kind of fall into place and uh, the doors that seem to open. So um, can you give an, can you give an example earlier in your career when you mm -hmm. were less secure, when you didn't go with the inner voice, but then natural consequences steered you in that direction anyway? Um, I would say one good example was following my first husband to New York. Um, I didn't necessarily want to go to New York, but he was so insistent that we had to go to New York. My first husband is Cecil Bridgewater. Of course, that's yeah, where, yeah, yeah, the man. That's where I got my name, Bridgewater. Right. Um, and so I just said, okay. Um, he had been hired to work with um, Horace Silver, who was 
my all-time favorite jazz composer. Um, yeah. And um, our first six months of marriage, we spent on the road with Horace Silver. That was my honeymoon. Um, but once we got settled in New York, <laughs> uh, Cecil was hired into the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra. I took a job at a bank because somebody had to bring home a, a, a check every week. Steady paycheck, um, yeah. My wife does that, too. Yeah, and but about six months into Cecil being with the band, um, Thad and Mel uh, decided that they wanted to have a female vocalist, and um, I ended up getting the gig. Can I ask you, Cecil? I mean, there's no. I was born in 1978, so mm, I mean, you're yeah. the same age as my second child. Yes, exactly. So, mm. so the idea here is that. I look back on the early 70s, what specifically was Cecil, he was like convinced that you could get real, a lot of gigs, right? Because I mean, there there was no more fertile time in our country's music cultural history than that exact period of time because it was pre-drum track, there was still authenticity within the music, all the drummers, all the cats that I talked to from the, I mean, I've done so much work with the psychedelic rock dudes. They all grew up with all the the, the legends, the Kenny Clarks, the Max Roaches, the mm -hmm. Mickey Rokers. Those cats weren't playing off the click track. They no. were, okay, so so authenticity was there. On top of that, you know, cocaine was not that prevalent yet. Disco had not infected us. Uh, <laughs> but I'm just saying this was the greatest period of time. This is when you started to peak or you started your really career. So what was his rationale for uh, for wanting so badly to go to New York? Well, that was where the work was. It was just that was if you wanted to have a career as a jazz musician, you had to go to New York. But you wanted to be a jazz musician, but you resisted. I didn't I didn't I didn't know that I wanted to be a jazz musician okay. per se. Okay. So I, I was angling for sun. <laughs> I was angling for the West Coast. He Thank was you. angling for the East Coast. Oh, I did. You would have been so hip out there. T something would have happened for for you. Oh, uh, probably something else, and maybe I wouldn't be alive today. That's I really no. That side, that whole never mind. That's a whole other conversation. Yeah, no, absolutely. We, I, we I, won't go down that road. You know, but, what, you um, know what I want to talk to you. This is really important. Is, is that, that okay? So you you talked about you wanted to be a, when you were seven years old. You wanted to be a respected international singer jazz mm -hmm. singer right be and i wanted to live in paris france which i never had it okay, everybody well, told I mean, them that too the, the, mm -hmm. the first part is is the pressing part it's like mm. the, the idea here is that uh you saw your mentors dizzy gillespie at that time okay was treated like a lawyer or a doctor was because of yeah. his, because of his craft okay mm -hmm. remember that i don't know if you knew about the whole campaign of dizzy for president no, th this is, of course, not. But uh, what I'm saying is that mm. I look at my, I, I vote, I love Barack Obama, mm -hmm. but he's not, re he was, he's not treated with any respect at all. So what I'm saying is that how have, you know, how is music and our role, what our role models are, how has it gotten to the point where music is no longer seen as a profession, that it's a pay to play kind of thing, and that we tear down our people that we call leaders in, in our history books and textbooks, and then we demonize them. I mean, Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie was hard to demonize because he was so smart and quick. But I don't know. I, I wanted to get your take. I think for – I haven't been on this earth as long as you. But, yeah. But I look at it and I say, that sophistication, that genius was appreciated. And I, and I want to get your perspective on it. Well, I mean, we were living in a simpler world also. You know, we didn't have the Internet, and it was still based on actual human interaction right. and human relationships. And I think what you're speaking about is, is, is really the humanitarian side of the music exactly. still existed, you know, where mm. musicians helped each other, um, where we applauded when someone succeeded, when someone broke rank and had something happen to them that allowed them to move to their next level. That was something that we all celebrated. There was no jealousy. There was a camaraderie. But that was also a period when family was important. I just had this discussion with a lady that's helping me since I can't get around with my foot. 
um, oh, cr- okay. how yeah, go ahead. that was a period when the family sat down to dinner. Yeah. There was a dinner time. That was a period when mothers and fathers were respected and grandparents were thought of as sages. So it's, it's, it's just been a whole kind of social sh- shift Absolutely. that has happened. Absolutely, right. And so I think that is, that is why there is such a difference today. Um, there are too many, I think, you know, when you have so many choices available to you, you can't help but get lost. We didn't have so many choices, you know, and it was something right. to buy an album and to be able to sit down and take an hour out of your day and listen to an album. We don't do that anymore. Music is kind of the, the backdrop of our lives. You know, you, you look at people and they've got their headphones on or their earbuds in, but they're working on something and they've got the music going and it's kind of like the background thing in their head. Well, let me ask you, how, where, I mean, are you, where do you, do you live in New Orleans or are you just there? I have moved to New Orleans. I moved here in June. Oh, that's pretty, that's pretty badass because that's a great, that's a happening place. I mean, it is. I mean, and I, I hope eventually to get involved with the city. Absolutely. You, you need to. But the thing is, um, yeah, I feel like it's uh, when you moved there too with your husband at the time in New York. No, 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 no. No, no, moved no, where? no, no, no. In, in New York, in the early. Oh, 70s. when I moved to New yeah, York. Yeah, okay. when you moved to New York, the culture, specifically the Africa, the really the culture was on the street. The music was coming out of the neighborhoods, and you don't. That culture is stifled today. When I talked to Larry Willis, he talked about Harlem. There's like, I mean, it used to have Sugar Ray Robinson up there. There was cultural figures, and ultimately, you had music the real music coming out into the streets Mm -hmm. and actually the vocabulary was made in the streets. Now Mm -hmm. there's, now there's no clubs to play in a propensity of people that have huge technique and no feel because they have no opportunities to gig live. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, my, my other point, uh, sort of escapes me, but it's just, there's, there's, there's a quality of, 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 there's a stifling and you can't, uh, and then, and then everything's moved into, which is great. I mean, I know everybody I talk to pretty much, at one time or other, has or had a teaching gig. But I don't believe that any vocabulary in music, whether it's bluegrass or soul, jazz, rock, anything like that, uh, can really grow w- within the four walls of academia. So, I mean, these are just like, I, to me, like you, it was, it, to me, it's, a, it's really to cherish that time and promote what was happening at that time in a live musical context for, for cats to open their ears again because music has also become electronic music. Like my two daughters have digital beats crunched into their ears for the last 10 years you know they can't mm-hmm. they can't hear the space in the music you know so i just mm-hmm. you know I, it's i'm not even ask i just I, to me at the time i guess it speaks to education people knew uh they knew they knew their cultural history they knew where they came from and i'm not sure about that anymore hmm um this is, I, we're, just, I, we're just jamming. You can go. Yeah, and you go yeah. Off, no, I, I think, yeah. Back in the in, in the sixties and seventies, yeah. I mean, we were pretty clear. Whatever your proclivity was towards the music, you were pretty clear about what that music was that you really, really liked, and where you wanted to go. Like, but like I was saying, Jake, we, there's so much out there today. It's hard for your kids. Your your two girls, you said. Yeah, yeah. They've been living with beats. They can't get to a lot of the real music unless it's through someone like yourself, their father, mm-hmm. someone that's got the history of the music that they can pass on to the, to the children so that the children can take a listen to it and then understand and, you know, eventually make a connection between what's going on now, how what's going on now is just a bastardization of what's already happened. You're exactly you know, right. Exactly. No, and you're you talking know, to the going back to the family at the dinner table thing. There's the father's not around anymore. Well, there is that too. There is that. There is that the as elder, well. The elder, the lack of respect. You know, you're, you're tying it together. I just want to. We have a game on this program, Dee Dee, called "Name mm-hmm. Name That Voice," and I mm-hmm. want I want you to take a listen to this voice. Identify, okay. and identify, and we'll come back and talk about it. Okay. But it's something that Wayne Shorter said to me one time. He said that the only way you can really, really, really play is that you have to go to the store and buy some milk for your grandmother. You know, 
<laughs> when he said that to me and the drummer, Omar Hakim. Now, he had a few few drinks. We were all drinking. Right. I said, wow. <laughs> but a couple of days later, it hit me, you know, because, you know, it's like to come, if you have one of those kind of families, you go to see your grandmother, she says, go to the store and get me some milk. And you go there, there's a love. There's a there's something, there's a love for something other than just what you're looking at. It's like your own personal love, which, you know, which could come from God, which could come from the force of, of life. It could be whatever it is that makes you, that you think makes you tick. Mm-hmm. That If you tap into that, whatever that is, it's not, it's not a material. It's not the instrument. It's not the notes. It's it's the life force. It's this. It's it, and that is very. When you operate on that band, that's uh, that's or on that uh, frequency in life, that is very spiritual. You know. All right, Dee Dee Bridgewater. Is that Joe Lovano? <laughs> Do you want to try again? No, Stan- I don't know who it is. Stanley Clark. That's not Stanley. I've done two interviews with Stanley. That's Stanley. That's Stanley back in uh, on my radio show back on uh, September 28th, 2014. Oh, my God. Well, see, I haven't talked to Stanley in a gazillion years. Sure. No, but but the point was, I mean, did you uh, can you can you riff on that frequency oh. when you got into a groove like that, Dee, Dee in your own career and what that feels like? Well, you know, you you. you First of all, you have to come from a spirit of of being open to receive in order to be able to to groove on 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 any riff, whether it's a life riff, whether it's a music riff. You've got to your ears have to be open, your spirit has to be open so that you're a- able to go with whatever that that flow is in that moment and and take it to another level because of the energy that you're going to bring to this flow. So um, I come from that kind of vibe, what, um, <laughs> what Stanley said that Wayne had shared with him, yeah. you know, about going to the store and get, get some milk for your grandma. That's it. I understood it right away. I know. I understood it. But I've had many conversations with Wayne. Um, <laughs> one of the things that Wayne said to me was he was sitting at, at, at the dinner table one evening with his parents and... Um, They'd said uh, something. They were talking about um, something going on in in the country politically. Sure. And um, one of his parents said, "Well, you know, in the United States of America." And he said, "No, it's the United Snakes <laughs> of America." <laughs> wow. And he said that as a child. And <laughs> we were so in quiet. the conversation, I was like, "Wow, Wayne, that's." You know, Spot that's on. very, very, very deep and astute for a child <laughs> to have that perception, you know. But I think, you know, Wayne is a perfect example of someone who has always listened to that God voice in him. He's always been a musician who's been true to his music, to what he believes in, and that has informed his entire life. And that's beautiful. That is absolutely stunning. Some of us, we, we don't have that kind of freedom or we're, we're, too, we're too inhibited. We're too caught up with what we think is going to, how we're going to be perceived or what we think other people are going to think of us if we do, you know, A, B, or C. So you have to get to that space, and that's what we were touching on a little bit earlier, where you're ready just to listen to your inner voice and just to go with whatever it is that is, is being spoken to you and to walk in that place that is a fearful place because it's an unknown. But if you walk in that space because you know that you are walking with this spirit voice or the universal voice of your life force, you will know that it's going to end up with the way it's supposed to. So it's being able to walk into this this situation of unknown but knowing that the truth is going to be revealed and that it's going to be a blessing in the end. And that's what I've been trying to do um, for no, the last, I mean, like, spot. 30 years. No, I mean, it's, I mean, I mean, do you feel, uh, do you feel completely liberated, Dee Dee, at this point? Absolutely. Can you talk about Well, I, I mean, I feel liberated, but I still, I have moments of, ooh, 
<laughs> is, ooh, you know, I have a new album coming out in May. Talk about it. It's, uh, it's called Memphis. And um, I was born in Memphis. Um, did, you and grow, when I, did you grow up with Booker T and those cats? I didn't grow up there. I left. We left when I was three. Okay. So you and then you. Okay. okay. And then I decided to go back um, and just try and understand where I was born, find the street I, I my family lived on when I was born, and all of that. Go to Manassas High School where my father taught. My father taught at Manassas High School, which is one of the two main. Uh, the only two black high schools when he was there from 1949 to 53 when we left. Um, and that was a school where they had a music program, but the music was basically marching bands. My father took their marching bands at, at Manassas High School and introduced those musicians to jazz. So my father taught people like Booker T. Um, David Porter. Um, no, 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 no. Uh, earlier, Charles Lloyd. Earlier. Char Char Charles Lloyd. Right. I don't think he got the George he was, Coleman. So your dad was a peer of like Jimmy Lunsford. Well, my dad is after Jimmy Lunsford. Was that, so it was Charles Lloyd and it was... I'm going to tell you if you'll let me. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Harold Mayburn, Charles Lloyd, George Coleman, Phineas Newborn, um, not Booker T, Booker Little, yeah. um, um, Garnett Brown, those were uh, the musicians, some of the musicians that my father taught at Manassas High School. Wow, that is awesome. Yeah. Wow. Do you have any, looking back, I mean, he didn't obviously produce a lot. I don't know if he wrote a lot, but what was his, can you talk about what he his concept of jazz was? I have no idea. I just found, I knew that my father taught these musicians, but my father is very close mouth. Okay. So we've not had that conversation, but I'm glad you asked me, so I'm going to ask him. But he did share with me um, in a conversation recently. My father's still living. He's 89. Um, both my parents are still living, so I'm very fortunate, and they're both 89. Bless you, yeah. Um, but he did share with me that um, he had the first marching band that became a jazz band that started to get requests to perform all over the state of Tennessee and even outside of Tennessee and Mississippi and Missouri. And um, so, I, but I know that he was after Jimmy Lunsford because my dad taught in 49. My dad was born in 27. So Jimmy Lunsford, I think, was out with his band in the late 30s. Did you try to um, put together, uh, like, a, what did you discover about, like, the Memphis Soul Stew? What is it like now? As I mean, you didn't even you were you, you left too early to know. Really. Well, I left early, but and as a teenager in Flint, Michigan, where I grew up, um, I was able to get a radio station late at night called WDIA, which um, was a radio station out of Memphis that programmed black music and played a lot of soul and alternative R and B. I would call it because I'm in Flint, and so I'm not far from Detroit, which was. Motown. Absolutely. So as a teenager, that was the big, big, big rage, you know, especially all around me. Um, but secretly, I would late at night listen to, you know, BB and and Bobby Blue Bland and you know Otis Redding and Rufus Thomas and you know all of these cats. <laughs> and um, that was like my secret stash. Right. So. <laughs> And I jammed with it, and I wanted to. I wanted to sing the blues, and my mother said, "Absolutely not! I will not allow you to be a singer and sing the blues. You can be a singer and sing jazz. You can sing R and B. You cannot sing the blues." So now that my mother's 89, and I'm 66, I think I'm old enough to do what I want to do. I dig it. I and so dig it. You'd sing in the blues on this. I'm singing some blues, and I'm singing some soul, and I love it. And it feel I feel like a duck out of water with it. It comes extremely easy to me. It feels it it's hard to imagine, but it's almost more comfortable than singing jazz. And I was absolutely stupefied when I started recording this album back in September. And I was in the studio and we did the first track and I, I went into the studio and my oldest daughter who does my management was there and her name is Talani and I, I said, Talani this this feels this feels like this is really comfortable to Lonnie. 
And she goes, Mommy, why are you surprised? And I go, well, because I've, I've never done it. She says, well, Mommy, but it's, it's, it's you. It's still a part of you. So I don't understand why you're surprised. It makes sense to me. I was like, okay, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, um, I absolutely love this music that I'm doing. Um, I love that I can shine a light again on Soulville, which is uh, what Memphis is known as. I recorded at uh, the very famous um, Royal Studio, Willie Mitchell's Royal Studio. That's and the that's High where Records. High Records. High Records. I yes. love those. I mean, I mm-hmm. you know those. That's Sil Johnson. Those cats. Were, were you getting that on the late night radio? Because those cats burn, man. But that was like love music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was getting a little bit of that too. Okay. So yeah. yeah. I, I you know what I I I really don't believe that you never. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an early morning jam session, never sang uh, Etta Jones tune in the early 70s or mid I, You had to have sung blues before, just maybe not on record. No, I, I've sung blues, yeah, before. And um, I was a very in a very, very special friendship with B.B. King. I met B.B. King in, like, 1986 in Paris, France. Hmm. And, oh, so um, you did get to Paris. Oh, I lived in Paris for 23 okay, years. Okay, right. So you, all your dreams came true. Or are they? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, they all my dreams came true, <laughs> and then and then some, and that's why I was trying to mention all of that mm-hmm. stuff in the beginning. Sure. Um, you know, in in trying to keep with and following, you know, the God voice within you, all of that, all of those predictions or those announcements that I made to my parents, I got, they have come true. You and just keep, um, keep riffing on BB. You met him in Paris. I met BB in Paris. He had me come and sit in with him, and from that moment on, any time our paths would cross, I had to sit in with B.B. I had to go and spend time with B.B., and and I I love B.B. very, very much. Um, so I do The Thrill is Gone for B.B. on this album, and um, I sang at his memorial in Las Vegas, and um, I really, really miss B.B., he was very, very special to me. And B.B. used to always say to me, baby, you should, you know, you should be singing these blues. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, and I, I go, yeah. Yeah, I know, B.B., but I want to do my job. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. I'm talking to Dee Dee Bridgewater here on, on Power Talk 1210. And um, I just, you know, uh, I'll let you riff on this, but I wanted to tee it up for you. I had a... Uh, a chance to I, I just I'm dwelling in the cosmos I, as a non-musician I, I I am not you know I love odd metered music I love all the abstractions and the all the stuff but I don't know anything about music theory so I'm, I'm into that I don't either <laughs> so go ahead <laughs> oh, that's that's that's, cla- that's classic so so I, this is this is Chico Freeman mm-hmm. uh, he said this is what he said on my show uh, in December he said um when I was with Dizzy, we went to Cuba, and they asked us to do an interview together. And one of the questions was, what is jazz? And Dizzy said, it's the search for truth. In this case, truth is who you are, who one is at the moment. The truth of who one is at that moment. The past is gone. The future is left to come. And we are only left with the present. Mm-hmm. The present is the only thing that's real. At the moment, uh, the search for truth within a group, and it's within a search for uh, for truth within the group context. It means that all of us are expressing ourselves on the bandstand and at the same time maintaining respect for each other's rights to express oneself and have conversation and not become overbearing. Mm. You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean... I, I, I'm in a complete agreement. I mean, can you talk about... Um, uh, I, can you talk about qualities of leadership? Uh, specifically, on the bandstand... You know, I love, we, we're such a verbose society. You talk about all the different myriads of options for everything out there. There's, it's, we're so saturated, but yet, and we hang on words. And there was so much nonverbal communication on the bandstand amongst the, your mentors. Mm-hmm. And I wanted you to talk about some of that nuanced quality, how, what, how you use it and, and what you would, what, what kind of nuanced leadership qualities, nonverbal on the bandstand. Well, um, what I try to have happen is to, I know that as the leader, as soon as I start doing the vocal, 
which is the melody of the song, that I'm setting the tone mm -hmm. for the way the song is going to go. So I, if now that I'm armed with that knowledge, then I know that I have the capacity with my voice to, to shape the outcome. So what I try to do, because I know this, is every night when we do a repertoire, I try to come at each song differently so that the musicians will know that, ah, we're going to go someplace new. I can't do what I did last <laughs> night. Um, for me, I'm trying to retain freshness as a band leader um, when I'm doing the material so that um, it can remain challenging, it can remain inspiring, it can cause the conversation to, to go to a higher level. Um, and the, the only thing that really can throw that off is fatigue. Um, the beauty of being a band leader is that you can set a certain level, whatever your level of, a, of, of a professionalism, professionalism is that you want to set as the artist and as the leader of the band. You set that level. And then no matter how tired you get, the bar should never go below that level. So I set my bar pretty high. And anyone that works in my band knows that I give 200% on the stage, and so I expect 200% out of everyone. And so if anyone gets sleepy on the bandstand, you will see me go over and do a little whisper in the ear. <laughs> I have taken people off the stage. That's a, that's a Van we, that's a Van Morrison move. I've never – Van – you fired someone on stage? I fired a few people on stage. During the live performance? Yes, in I front love of the it. audience. I love uh, – this is – Out loud so that everyone knew. Wow. Yes, wow. I have. Wow. I, yeah, I dig that. Yeah, well, you know, if you – you know, and my – what I've said – in almost every situation is I hired you to perform a specific job. You did not come to the bandstand prepared with that job. You are expecting to be paid for the job I was expecting you to do. Therefore, since you thought so little of me that you didn't think it was necessary to learn your job, I don't need you. And they will go with, but, and I'm like, no. You see, because actually, I have the original instrument. Right. I could stand on that stage and I could perform without a band. I have that security and I have that confidence within myself and within my art artistry to know that I could give a, a show. But there is a beauty in, in, in numbers and there is a beauty when you come together collectively as a group and each, each element of that group is integral to the, the, the sound that you're trying to create with that group. Um, I, so I expect everyone to come to the bandstand with the love and the respect for the music that they are doing, and that they've been hired to do with me and with a certain level of professionalism. And if you don't bring it, I will call you out in front of everyone. And just for the record, it's verbal communication that Dee Dee uses on the bandstand to tell people to get off the stage. I always go. Oh, sometimes I've used eye. It's been eye contact. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it, when I was, I, I, I remember one of the turning points in my career as a broadcaster was I, inter I had a chance to interview Dave Holland, and he was talking mm -hmm. about when he joined Miles, which was a story mm -hmm. in and of itself. Or he was telling a story when, when Train used when Train first joined Miles. Train kept going up to Miles and say, "What do you want me to play? What do you want me to play?" And Miles kept turning his back on him. Mm -hmm. And it was like, finally, Coltrane got it. He's like, oh, he's like, Miles wants me to be myself. I mean, yeah. this is a little bit different because he wasn't give. He was giving it his all. It wasn't shortchanging or, or pissing off Miles, but he really didn't. Miles just didn't say anything to him. He just let him figure it out on his own. And ultimately, you got what you got. But to me, it was like it. To, it was so fascinating. And then on top of that, um, the rhythms that were going on. Uh, I have to ask you, your first album entitled Afro Blue, 
Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk about your relationship with Mongol? Was that just a song that, uh, how, how did that come about? Um, I didn't have a relationship with Mongo Santa Maria at all. Um, Afro Blue was a composition of his that I loved. And um, Did you write a li original lyrics to it? No, Oscar Brown Jr. wrote the lyrics to Afro Blue. I can't believe you just dropped his name because he was talking, Ben Vereen was talking about Oscar Brown Jr. He said, you know, uh, Oscar Brown said, you want to have lessons, acting lessons, come to my pad. Uh, and he said, uh, he, I went over there and he looked at, he looked at me like something out of the Karate Kid. And he said, sweep the floor. I said, what? I went to get a broom. And he said, no, do it without the broom. He showed me how to use my imagination from within. I, I mean, I just feel like you were one of the luckiest people in the world. And now you have an opportunity to pass that along. And I wonder how, what, what is Dee Dee Bridgewater's concept? of love as we move into these historic times mm -hmm. after really basically, I mean, if you look at it at the simplest level, the guy who got elected started a movement called the birther movement, which basically said that our president was not from this country. He was foreign. He was different. Therefore, the, all the people that voted for him, Barack Obama, are therefore the same. They are different. They are foreign. They are not American. So that's the insult that people are feeling in their gut right now. And yet you need to counteract that, in my mind, by talking to spiritual people, loving people, people like yourself who have the internal confidence to know I can get on the bandstand and I have the, the original instrument and I can do it, but be inclusive about it as well. And I just wanted you to just riff and give some words of wisdom about your concept of love as we move into an incredibly callous and very dangerous time um love is 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 giving without receiving in return love for me is just giving of oneself completely complete abandon and and sharing without the person receiving feeling a need to give back that is that's that's what love is for me. Mm -hmm. When I go onto the stage, I am trying to share love. I have a love for life. I love. I have a love for the higher power. I'm very careful how I choose to talk about that higher power, that mm -hmm. universal force, whatever one, however one chooses to call it. I believe that there is an ulterior force that's alive and breathing and well and within all of us in, in the world. Um, I believe that I'm trying to get to my highest spiritual level before I leave this earth. So I'm trying to project that kind of unconditional love when I get on the stage. And I try and do it through the music, through, through the, the, the stories that I'm telling, through the banter that I I do in between the songs um, through the sharing that I do on the stage with all of the musicians through what can the respect and how that can be perceived by the audience member um, I try to show the beauty of, of freedom of expression being free with my body and being able to be free within the space and not be concerned about movement in that space um so i and my goal as i touched on earlier is to eliminate any stress to inspire people to give them to have them walk out of the the theater or whatever space they've come to hear me in feeling like life is not impossible that they can achieve something that that thing that they are wanting to do, they can do it. That's what I want people to walk out of the theater feeling. That they can move forward. And it's not as bad as they thought when mm -hmm. they went in. Mm -hmm. You know, and... and um, it's like Art Blakey said, uh, my job is to wash away, for those patrons, it's my job to wash away the dust of everyday life. Yeah. But this is not every day that we're living in anymore. 
Well, we do live day to day. We do live day to day. I mean, we are living in in a world now where you you know we could, we've got statistics, we've got all this stuff that can project what our future is going to be, but we don't really know. We don't really know. I didn't know on December 21st uh, when I went to bed, well, December 20th, that when I woke up on December 21st and was running down my stairs that I was going to miss a stair and tear my tendon completely. I didn't know that. I hope and when did. I was I going down those yeah. stairs, I was going down with complete abandon because I know where I live, and I know those stairs, and I knew I was at the bottom, but I wasn't. So, I mean, I'm, I'm using that as an example to say we don't know, and we can't tell. You, there's no way. You know, I, I say we've moved into a world of completely unknown variables with this new administration. We don't know what we're going to get, but it doesn't it – doesn't, what we have to remember is we do have control of our individual lives to a large extent. And what we do with ourselves as individuals, that is still a, our choice. That hasn't been taken away from us. But, but yeah, I think, I think that that's the most prescient point. Um, my wife is Taiwanese. Uh, you know, I, we have a multi-racial family. Um, I would love you to tell the audience what if you and why you are proud of Barack and Michelle Obama. Well, I'm proud of what Barack and Michelle Obama represented for us. They gave us the true sense and value of family. They were such a beautiful family themselves and they believed so much in the importance of family and of being inclusive. And so that, I think, is what they brought during the eight years that they were in the White House. They gave a feeling of inclusiveness to so many people and a, a, a sense of being part of, of a big family. That was kind of what I got from the two of them collectively, as a couple, mm -hmm. as our president and first lady. And they made me proud because in their inclusiveness, they were not afraid to be hip, you know, to, to be loose, to show that they were just regular folks, you know, it was it was a, it was just a beautiful thing. It was it, it's it's authentic. It was totally authentic. Right. As we saw as they walked off the stage last night. Exactly. Totally authentic. Arm in arm, close. Yeah. They have each other, and they have those girls, and we got to be a part of that, and they shared all of that with us and they I thought they they governed with love with a true sense of love for everyone and we'll miss them uh, you, can you talk about um, something you, you you expect 200% out of everybody on the bandstand you give 200% is there an area in your artistic endeavors that you are still challenging yourself or can you talk about just what you want to keep pushing and and if you could actually throw in an inspiring moment that you had in 2016, whether personally or, on, you know, you witnessed it. Um, I, I just love, I mean, there's only two letters that separate magic and music, so. <laughs> That's cute. Um Something that was inspiring in 2016. Um, 2016 for me, what was, well, let me see, let me see. What was inspiring for me in 2016 was watching the growth of Theo Croker, 
and each of the members of his band, which he calls Dark Funk, because um, I hired Theo's band to be my band um, when his album that I had produced came out in 2014. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that has been my band. Theo's band has been my band um, until now and until I changed, you know, my repertoire. So my next band is going to be a Memphis-based band um, because of the music being from Memphis and being soul and R&B um, or, and blues. I, I need those kinds of players. Um, but what was inspiring was watching and hearing the musical growth in each member of that band and to know that I was an integral part of that growth because of individual conversations I'd had with each member of that band to try to help them individually in the development of their instrument and their skills. And that was an inspiration, to see the zest for life and the zest for creativity that these young men have and then to have them put it into effect on the bandstand with me every night that we would play. That was inspiration. And that let me know that I'm on the right track in terms of where I want to be with my music. I think it's time for me to help young musicians and to to try and help shape them in their formative years. I want to do that. Mm-hmm. I want to do more of that. Yeah. And now I understand a lot of the great jazz legends before me who always kept young players. I couldn't understand why, <laughs> but now I've got it. It's because they wanted to help mentor, but also because of that zest of life, it comes back to you, the mentor. And it gives you a new lease on life. It makes you want to go out and do more. I love that. I love that. So that's what I learned. Well, um, do you feel and like? And I was—I I got commissioned uh, to produce a film documentary on Stan Getz. Mm. Okay. Now Getz uh, was oftentimes on the bandstand in what he referred to as the alpha state, which was this sort of this state where you're not thinking because the more that you think in jazz, in his mind, the worse it sounds. So it was mm-hmm. just this idea of just, and, and he'd get this stare in his eyes, and I, who knows where he was even staring at. But, you know, Joanne Brackeen, it was just, it was a cosmic thing. They, they, these people do, can't explain it. It's just the way it worked out. Is there, is there an alpha state for Dee Dee Bridgewater? Sure. Can you at any way, can you talk about uh, how you? I think it's just an, it's an it's a it's a euphoric experience. But at the time, you're trying to. I just want you to t- talk, take us through it with the feeling. Well, it's so you you saying alpha for me? I call it the gray state. Any, it's, go ahead, yeah. Any way you want to do it. Yeah, it's. I'm trying to figure out how to put it into words. It is, it is when you go into a moment with no expectation and with a sense of complete abandon, abandon, and you have other people contributing and feeding into this kind of state of grace, and together, all of a sudden, all of the the communication meshes into this energy mm-hmm. that just becomes more powerful than any of the parts that are creating that energy. And it's an energy that then takes everyone. It, it engulfs everyone. And you go into this space, and it's just, I don't know, there's no other word but divine. It can be, and it's a, it's, it's a space that can last for maybe a song or it can last for a whole show, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's just beautiful. And when you come away from it, you go, wow, what was that? I love it. What was that? I love it. And it's, it's, it's a thing that when it happens, 
I mean, it goes from the bandstand into the audience, and it just becomes this energy. It becomes this kind of pure, radiant, palpable, positive energy, just like a, a sweet space that you create for this moment that everyone falls into and where there's like there's no time there is there's nothing it's just you're in this indescribable space there's no tiktok time no there's no time <laughs> no tiktok time <laughs> no, yeah it's just it's it's just like a moment it's like being suspended it's kind of like a, a, a creative energy suspension is what happens. And everyone gets caught up in it. And you don't even know that it's happened until it's done. And you're like, <gasps> what was that? What was that? And then, you know, people are going, oh, my goodness, oh, my goodness. Or they're even going, oh, my God, what was that? What was that? What happens on those, when those moments happen, when we come off the stage, I'll say to the guys, okay, guys, we just had a moment of grace. We just have to accept it. Let us try and, and wash ourselves in it a little more. But is it something you cannot recreate? You'll never have it again. It was a moment of grace. Did you have any of those moments on this recent album? Just about every song I did was a moment of grace. That's beautiful. Yeah. So it's going to um, be a killer album. It's um, very special. A lot of love on this album. I would say probably there's a gospel song that I have wanted to sing that I do on this album, and I, I performed it with some of the students from Stax Academy. And um, they became my choir. And that was a true moment of grace you know, in the studio. Okay, so just for, you, for especially young, I have two young girls, but I'm talking about just, you know, girls all over who are just trying to express themselves. Again, I'm, I just want to ask you, you know, I did two, two interviews with M. Tume, uh, mm -hmm. and, and he was like, how do you think, uh, think hip-hop started? He's like, the cats went to the park. Okay, and what I'm getting at is, okay, they have the Stax Academy, uh, you know, they have Juilliard. I mean, all the cat. I mean, you know, the, the, they have these, you know, with academic areas. I don't believe you can play a street music in academia. So, with that being said, and the shortage of venues, can you talk about, you know, I don't know, back? Did you play on the Chitlin Circuit? No, the Chitlin Circuit. Never the Chitlin Circuit. But I'm saying, did, can you talk about this like organic? time where you you really didn't have anything but you made it up and, and like you you created language you know maybe you just were playing on the street corner but the point is like use your imagination because cats are getting you know i mean people i caught the tail end of soul uh 78 you know i mean disco infected this country sped up everything i just want you to talk about making 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 sometime in your life when you made something up just spontaneously and had no resources, but then you, you know, outside. Well, when I was a when I was a teenager, you know, we did doo wop. That means, you know, we would get our little groups together and harmonize and sing, not necessarily literally on the corner, but we would sing on the street. We'd maybe be on somebody's steps, you know, somebody's stoop, as <laughs> as we would call it back in the day. Day. Or, you know, hanging out in somebody's basement and just making up just little harmony riffs that that we would do. Um, or somebody would just start making up a, a melody and, and all of a sudden everybody would be finding their little notes to do background vocals on it and, and um it would be the, it, it would be that kind of a thing when, when I was growing up, you know. Um, and per it was person to per it was human. It was person. It was person. it was very person to person. person, to person and a lot of our stuff was a cappella, because not a lot of the people that I was hanging around played instruments. So what we did was all vocal and a cappella. So sometimes you know somebody would be doing the rhythm, you know, vocally. 
and that's just the way it was. Wow, that's interesting. Rhythm, vocal rhythms. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Key, just that rhythm is, is essential. Um, Dee Dee, I, I do, I really want to stay in touch with you. I, I, I have such, I've amassed over six years. I mean, just today I interviewed you and George Benson today. Yeah, you know, that's I mean, pretty I, awesome. Fi- it, it, dude, Cosmic Day, I have 500 interviews with Garnett Brown and Charles Lloyd and Bobby Hutcherson. And, and I, I, I mean, I'm doing everything I can to blow them out on new media, social media. Right. The stories resonate like crazy. I mean, these, but I just want to keep going. I mean, I have found my, I, when you were talking about channeling that inner voice and you could, mm-hmm. you could leave everybody else and go up and be totally cool on the bandstand. I feel the same way. I'm, I'm chomping at the bit and I'm just trying to enlighten and love people and communicate human in, with, you know, with humans in the digital age. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I just want to stay in touch with you somehow and, and, and be able to get, get this stuff out to even more people. Obviously jazz is international language. You're kind of going, hearkening back to the blues on, on the new album, but you, you get my drift. I mean, I, yes, I, I do, you know, I'm, I'm just, uh, I've been, I've been really at this for a while. I found my niche and I want to keep growing, you know, I understand. Right. I on. understand. Yeah. Well, you got my number. Right. And at least can always put you in touch with me. Right. Okay. So I am accessible. I love you. Uh, take care of yourself. And uh, well, thank you. If you, I, you, know, you if, too, Jay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I interviewed Martha Reeves last year. And oh my God. Rita Coolidge, and I mean, I love. Oh my God. I, I mean, I've most of the guys have been dudes, you know. I mean, but I mean, I take them all over these crazy. I mean, we didn't even talk about psychedelics today. Mm, mm, mm. No. <laughs> but but uh, much love to you, and uh, and if you need, thank I mean, you. I mean, if you want to get, I I pop any of the meters or or any of the cats down there you want to you want to get hooked up with like i mean i i can i can help you out they love me i think that's the other point is that Didi, you're not my generation but your generation on facebook loves what i'm doing jerry G- awesome jerry jamat michael shreve garibald all these cats they know the significance of the jake feinberg show so you know anyway that's fantastic let Jake. the four winds blow you str- you know safely home my friend and uh, uh that is Thank you. All right. You are a special young man. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll get you a copy of this as soon as possible. Uh, love, All right. Love to you. Take care. Much love to you, okay. too. I hope I'll meet you. Will you be there? Where's there? Oh, oh I, you, I mean, for the show. Yeah, no, where? So, <laughs> well, I mean, I've been trying to get after you for a long time. It just happens you're now coming to Tucson. Absolutely. Let, let, let's make it a point to... Uh, to connect either, uh, you know, before I'd love to come to sound check and, and take some video. On, for, anyway, maybe we could do something like that. It'd be really cool. Okay. Well, we're all coming in on day of show. So, um, I think we are all in Tucson by noon. I don't know yet what time, cause we're just, I don't think we're going to have a sound check. I think all we're going to have is a line check. We might have a rehearsal. Hold on one sec. I want to look this up. Okay. Dee Bridgewater. Uh, yeah, no, I, I was just, I get into the, I forgot that, I, I okay, so it's, uh, <clears throat> Tucson Theater. We're at the Fox. Friday, January 20th at 8 p.m. at the Fox. Mm-hmm. I love that you're going to be singing at the Fox. I don't know, I really would just, you know, they, I just would love to meet you, uh, and, and give you a hug and, and, and hang for a minute, you, you know, the before or after the show. Okay. Uh, I'm sure they can give me tickets to go to the of show. Of course. But, uh, yeah, let's just stay in touch. I got your number. Absolutely. We'll, we'll, uh, and we'll be, uh, you know, have a have a beautiful, uh, just to have a safe trip, and, and we can't wait to see you down here in Tucson. Uh, well, I'm happy to be coming back finally. Yeah. I'm very, very happy to be coming back. But your words need to be heard around the world, and they will be once uh, mm-hmm. I start transcribing some of this stuff. Anyway, well, I, I had a ball. Well, yeah, I, I had a ball too, and I thought how wild because I just spoke to Ben today, so I just found out that's very wild. He would bring Ben up. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. And and Stanley, that's wild. Wow, you t- see, but see, that's what that, that's what I'm. Ch- but see, that's the that's the thing is that at 38, and even a non-musician, and hardly ever really being inculcated with these communities, the only people I gravitate to are Norman Connors. Pat Martino, mm-hmm. Stanley Clark, all these dudes. Mm-hmm. That's that to me. I mean, I've been doing this for so long. West Coast, East Coast, Studio Cats. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter. The point is that it's it's about hum- 
person to person, like Stephen Ferrone with, you know, with you, you, you know, wh- average white band. But, mm-hmm. you know, but there, within that, there are cracks and crevices. Sure. And I'm not a, I'm not a big reader. So the enlightenment has come from you. So bless you, my friend. Ah, uh, bless you. Yeah. You are a special, special being. Yeah. Well, Thank you. Right. Thank you so much. Spread the word too. All right. Okay. All right. All right my Carry dear. on, friend. You too. Later. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.